Okay, well, I want to welcome everybody here to NorCal's um, general meeting for January. And our demo tonight is with our secretary uh, and um, great helper, Bill Ryman, who's going to be uh, showing us pen turning. So here's Bill. All right, hopefully everybody can hear me. Can you hear me, Tony? Hopefully that's oh, yes. I hear yes, you. I can, I can All right. hear you. Yeah, you're, you're doing volumes good, everything's good. <clears throat> Thank you. All right, so I'm Bill Ryman, secretary, all of a sudden, got to kind of volunteer for that. So I'm going to show you pen turning tonight. I think it's a great introduction to, to wood turning. Um, a lot of people do it with the carbide tools, which is, you know, a very easy learning curve. So we'll start with some pen blanks here. You want to switch over to this camera, Kenny? So there's plenty of blanks to go with. These ones are the wood ones right here. This one is a Bocote, you probably butchered, butchered that, but Bocote pen blank. I personally like to do a lot of the acrylics and other materials like plastics, get these cool colors. Some of the wood just doesn't pop as much in such a small item as a pen. I find that a lot of the acrylic blanks that have these nice, clean, sharp edges turn a lot better than ones that are similar to this right here. This one right here, you can see the edges are all chipped up. This is a very brittle pen blank, and it'll cause you a little bit more problems, especially when you get to like a slimline pen kit when you get the material real thick. So next step, we're gonna show you the first step. We're gonna cut a pen blank. We're gonna go over here, Chris. All right, try not to step on any cords here. So I typically use my miter saw. Chris has his nice band saw right here, so we're going to do that. So first off, we got the brass tube. You want to measure it on your piece right here and give yourself a little extra room. So Chris has already marked this out right here. It's one length. If we cut it over here, as the other mark. And we also put a mark across there to show that that's where those two pieces meet. So we can line them up when we're drilling and when we're turning. Then so we'll go ahead and cut it. There's one. And two. That's those done. Um, then when we go to drill them, there's a couple ways of drilling it. First, we'll start here on the drill press. Chris has a self-centering vise here. So when you turn the knob, these two plates come together at the same time. And so it doesn't matter what size your pen blank is or even bigger blanks, bottle stoppers, if you need to drill those. We're going just fine. Then we just slide that in here, like so. Turn that up. All right. Yeah. Get that going. We'll just drill right on through it. I like to clear the hole a few times as I'm going through it. Maybe not be necessary for such a short drilling but that's what I prefer to do. Almost through. And there we go. All the way through. And now Chris's garage is gonna smell like a nail salon. Well my wife definitely doesn't care for it when I'm turning the acrylics. So here we go. Drilled all the way through. Now I'll show you another way to drill it over here on the lathe. That's how I usually do mine at my house. Is I got the, I got right here, the pen drilling vise. So just got the two jaws, similar to that vise we were just using on the drill press. And I will go ahead and tighten that up. I'm gonna bring the tail stock forward. Real close. This is just a we're doing the slim line pin kit, so this is a seven millimeter drill bit. I'm going to get this going. I tend to drill at a lower speed with a lot of friction. So I don't want it to melt the plastic too much. So we'll just start going in. 
Typically when I'm doing this on my lathe, I go the full length of my quill here. I'm not sure how long Chris's is, but mine takes two or three full lengths of it. So I think we're almost at his full length. We'll How see here in just a second. Let me just go and pull this out. Yes, sir. It's not critical. I mean, you can make your own kind of like bites for the drill press if you want it. Uh, if you're going to do it on a lathe, I think they're, it's pretty crucial to get it centered. Um, I'm not quite sure how else you would do it. You could probably fit it into a four jaw chuck. But it's just a little more difficult to get it perfectly centered. And depending on the size of your pen blank and what size pen you're doing, you don't have to be perfectly centered in the blank. But it is important to make sure you have a straight hole. We don't want to have a crooked hole going through there because then the brass tube we're going to put in there will not fit quite right. I'm going to take this out. I'm going to glue in the brass tubes. I'll do it right here. If this works for everybody, I'll do it right here. So here's a typical slimline pen kit. You've got the two brass tubes that come in it because it's a two-piece pen. Let me show you an example of one of the pens. Here's an example of a slimline pen kit. So it's the two piece right here. So the two brass tubes are inside there. And you just got all the other parts we'll go through later when we put the pen together. And then before we put the tube in, it is very smooth right now. Let's take a piece of sandpaper, 200 grit or somewhere around there is fine. I'm just gonna scuff it up a bit. And then I'm gonna grab my pen little insertion rod here. You can do it with your hands too. I did that for a long time, but I have a habit of gluing my fingers to the pen blank and the pen tube. So I started using this guy right here. So we are going to set that down. We're just going to get the glue here right on top. This is a CA glue. I'm sure everybody knows that one. Um, I do the medium. I kind of like it. Just do three or four lines down this pen plug. And as I insert it, I like to just twist it in. Just like so. Try to get that glue everywhere. Now Chris does one where he glues it and he inserts it from one end, pulls it out, and then the other end. Just to make sure you get the glue all the way through. Any which way you like to do is good. So I'll stop there. As you can see, it's kind of in a little bit, the brass tube on both sides. We cut it long and we like that. Now we're just going to use some activator for the CA glue. We'll just spray it in there. Now, I prefer to wait a little while to turn it. So I'm going to set this particular blank aside and move on to the one that we are going to the next. So, Bill, if you ever have a problem, there you go. Do you ever have problems with the glue getting inside down the tube? So uh, a couple times I have, um, but we're not careful. But next up, we do the, the pen mill, and some of these pen mills, I mean, it's not razor sharp or anything, but the tip of it right here, these are kind of like little cutters. So that will help clear out the brass tube as you mill the end of it. So the pen mill is because, like I said earlier, these brass tubes are inside it a little bit. We cut, the, cut it long. So this pen mill, I just use it on a drill. You can put it on your drill press, however you'd like to do it. What it's going to do is the cutters here, right here, that this slides in the tube, these make it perfectly per perpendicular to the brass tube. So perfect 90. That makes sure that the end of the pen blank is going to be nice and clean. So we're just going to go do the four sides real fast. Apologize if it's too loud. So we just keep going until we reach that brass tube. We don't really want to cut the brass tube. It's already at the length it's supposed to be at. If we shorten it, 
some parts of the pen may not work quite right. Nope, oh, right over here. Thank you, Chris. So let's keep going here. A little bit more on this side. Chris told me when we got set up yesterday that I have to keep talking. I told him we're going to give him a stick so he can just poke me in the back every time I get too quiet. So he didn't use a stick this time, which I appreciate. He just told me to move over here under the camera a little more. Oops, almost dropped it. I like that people say good catch when you catch something, but it's also like, well, I'm also the one that dropped it, so good drop too. So there we go. So now we got, pardon me, I'm going to blow on this a little bit. Now we got both all ends of this, this drill right here. So this particular blank I love. I've made two other pens of it, one for my wife and her, one for her best friend. This is from Craft Supplies. they got this new Diamond Cast Pen Blank series, and this one is called Oil Slick. So I've made several different ones of them, but I particularly love the Oil Slick because it just makes a really cool looking pen. So now this pen blank's ready to go, and we're going to go ahead and turn on the lathe. But first, we've got to get some stuff off here. I'm going to take off the chuck. Hold on one sec. I've got to loosen the adapter here because my chuck's a little small for Chris's lathe. So just bear with me. I've been turning for about five years now. Um, started off, I still have. You know, the lathe I started with from uh, from Rockler, it's the Excelsior Little Lathe. I got it on a roll around island bench. Let me do that again. I don't make too many big pieces. I only do 10 inches wide at most. But I make some pretty cool looking stuff, I think. And then my wife, she's amazing, and she found out that there is a club, NorCal Wood Turners, that I should go check out. So my first meeting with the club was in January a few years ago, and it was at the school. And back then, I don't remember his name, but he was uh, demonstrating the three-corner bowl. You guys remember that meeting? Uh, yeah, I forget. Yeah, it. I think it was Don D. I've seen him many times. Uh, All right, So to start with, we got. Before I get too far ahead of myself, this is a mandrel. So this particular mandrel is called the Pen Saver from Penn State Industries. Um, I like it because this slides right through the end of it, which goes on the tailstock. Instead of having uh, like a 60 degree life center on the end with your little brass nut, you have to fill it up with random pieces or other bushings. So we'll start with this, put that there. This will go on the tailstock. We got the bushings. I had a good catch after one drop, then I dropped it again. The bushings here are going to help us turn the pen to each of the ends to fit the sizes of the pieces of the pen. So like the, the cap, the center piece, and the tip. So I'm going to put one at the beginning, and all three of these for this particular pen are the same size. One thing I forgot to mention earlier, is, or I did mention, is how Chris likes to, and I do too, usually label everything which way they go. I forgot to on this one. So I'm thinking it's somewhat like this, just to line it up. But we're just going to go for it since I don't have it more. So get the bushing between it, slide those together. Now we're going to slide the tailstock forward. There we go, just like that. Now we tighten up the tailstock. It's just the friction, or not friction, friction the pressure against the bushings, which is a, which push on the brass tubes. Holding everything nice and tight. And we get tool rest all set up. It's always weird working on someone else's lathe. I kind of feel more for the other demonstrators when you have to do it at the uh, hall. Because then you got like everybody staring at you. Now I just got Chris and Kenny behind me. And I'm just staring at a wall. All right. That looks about right to me. I don't need to get too close. First, I'm going to start with my bowl gout. I prefer using it just for material removal. Some stuff is a little, get a little uh, clean and get detailed with it. But I usually get to the end, I switch to my 
carbide, replaceable carbide tip, just a little pen turning tool. Got this one at Rockler. Uh, came free with my lathe. It was a cool Black Friday special. So I like the square one to clean this stuff up. I also got the other round one, but we won't be needing that this time. So we'll start with the bowl gouge. And I'm going to start off here. Bear with me, like I said, it's not my lathe. I'd like to turn little pens at a higher speed. Bigger bowls and stuff obviously go a lower speed, but big thing is always make sure it's not too fast for safety. And I'm just going to start going and remove as much material as I can. Let me tighten up my test off a little more. Get a little more speed on there. My little lathe is not a variable speed by knob. I have to change the belts, and I just know I put it on the highest speed when I turn pens and the lowest speed when I stand them. I'm kind of guessing at the speed here with Chris's lathe. This makes a uh, beautiful confetti mess everywhere. Almost like glitter. Brings a little cover to Chris's shop. I'm not sure how well you guys can hear me, but it's pretty loud. I feel like you guys wouldn't be able to. Going. But hopefully it's cutting out the noise of the lathe real well. As you can see, like right down here, that's the edge left over. You see a little ghost image from where the pen, uh, the pen trimmer, barrel trimmer, had cut into it. So we'll just take that little bit off and now we're right there is now the edge of the pen. I think over here is a little bit left too. But we'll just keep going. When you first start turning the pen, it's okay to be use a little force to take stuff off. But if you get thinner, you want to be a little more careful. Especially with the slimline pen blanks. Because when you're done turning it, there's really not much material left of the pen blank on the barrel. I kind of think that the slim lines are a little more difficult than some of the others, but they're very economical and a great, you know, kind of starting one because you could buy a whole bunch of them for cheap. But there are other pen blanks out there, not just pen blanks, but pen kits out there, where it leaves a lot more material on the last two. You can do any kind of shape you want. I kind of have this shape I always do well, most of the time. So it starts out kind of thin. The top and the bottom are roughly shaped the same. So it starts out meeting, obviously, the bushing here. And then it just kind of works out. It's so about right here. And then I come start coming back a little bit. It's going to be a feminine. It's look kind of elegant. I'm almost done with my fold out on this one, then I'll come back through with the carbide tool. So as I was saying earlier, I've been turning for, I don't know, somewhere around five years now. And pens and handles were going great. Okay, here we go again. All right, I think we're good to go. So I heard Ted a uh, little bit there, just for a moment off his computer, that it does not have to be thin. He's absolutely correct. You can change, turn it to any shape you want. Here's a mechanical pencil, kind of like the similar to Simline style. You know, kind of bulbous here at these ends. Just come down to meet the different parts of the pen. There's another Simline I did. This one. And this is weird shape. So you turn it any shape you want, as long as the pen's functional. This one is real big here, so I decided to skip the clip on it. It would be pushing the clip out and not really working too well. But we're going to go ahead and continue turning this one. You can see it's kind of kind of chippy along, but we're going to use the carbide tool to help clean that up. All right, get going. All right. There we go. I'm going to move this a little closer if I can. I think we're maxed out on how far it goes over. Be very careful. Just going to keep taking little bits off at a time because it has gotten pretty thin. 
keep going back and forth. Try not to give it too much pressure. I don't think I've ever turned a pen while talking the entire time. That's a new experience. So just this little bit with the carbide, probably cleaned it up real nice. We'll take a quick look here. A lot of it's disappeared. There's still a little bit of chipping we'll have to get through. It probably stopped with the bulge out earlier, but I'm kind of focused on getting this done quicker. I know we have a time limit. Just going to go through here and keep going. A little bit more takeoff right here. So I was saying earlier, McDale came in and offered to teach anyone how to turn a bowl. So we get more bowls for the empty bowls program. So I went to her house about a couple weeks after the Christmas party and taught me how to make a bowl. And that was amazing. There's nothing like hands-on experience. You know, YouTube videos are amazing. I love them. But there's nothing quite like having a person teach you, stop you when you're doing something wrong and correct you and just those little minute hand movements. Sometimes it's just the twisting of a tool a little bit, rotation, and makes everything better. So in plenty of both sense. Quite enjoy all of this. And then for Christmas for my work, we have about 20 or somewhere between 20 and 25 employees. So I made pens for each of them. I handed them out at the Christmas party. So that ate up quite a lot of my time, November and December. And you get kind of a run out of ideas sometimes, like different shapes, where you just keep making the same pen out of different materials. Let's stop this for a sec and clear this all. So I can see what I'm doing over here. Let's go a little bit of enough. Yeah. Go back. Right. Keep moving here. And so as you come to these edges, you want to try not to cut the bearing. It's definitely not the worst thing that could happen, but as you always say, to make the bearing smaller, dull your tool. And you want to use these bearings on other projects too. Alright, I think this one's just about done. Whenever I'm turning a pen, I always put the tip of the pen on the top of the pen at the headstock. Just like to keep it oriented, always know which way I'm kind of got it going. Just trying to get rid of that last bit of chipping I left in here. I think I'll start to run out of material real quick. Just want to check here how we're doing with each of these bushings. That one's good over there. All pretty good. You could take a little more off. Bear with me, everyone that uh, has already turned a million pens, and maybe you have a different way of doing some of this stuff. The only way it works as long as you're safe about it, and the, you can write with the pen at the end, right? Yeah, I think that's going to do it for the turning portion. I'm just going to go keep standing. I'm afraid I'm going to keep it up. So I'm going to try to sand that last bit out. I'll just move some of the stuff out of the way. When I sand, I like to do it at a bit of a lower speed. It creates a lot of friction. And don't want that. So, do a few different types of sanding. When I do the pans, I use my little sandy kit. I'm sure plenty of you guys have it. A little multi-roll pack here with the 150 all the way up to 600 grit. So we'll start with that one. Since I had a lot of chips, I'm going to go ahead and start with the 150. Don't always go with that, but we're going to go ahead and go with that. 
if I make this as quick as possible, it'll still come out with a really nice pen. Oh, this is like the worst part of printing, isn't it? Sanding, sanding, and more sanding. But I'd love to get one day a little engraver, field engraved pens. That'd be really cool. Not sure how well that would work. I know Chris has an engraver, but he says it's hard to engrave on the really round stuff. So I don't think it'd work on a pen too well. All right. Yeah. Just about done with that first piece. That one had the most of the chips on it. I said, probably should have stopped through with the bowl gouge, but it's all right. It's all good. Now, I thought it'd be. Well, I'm gonna... Yes, sir. Bill, yeah, I'm going to interrupt you a minute. Go for it. So, um, we did uh, engrave on the pens once. Yeah. A bunch of us made pens for a. Uh... Uh, college. They okay. Cut a tree down and had a. They wanted uh, pens made out of this special wood and the name of the college uh, engraved down the side. So you can do it um, if the if the writing is small enough and you're going along the length of the pen. Uh huh. Um, and I imagine you could probably set up some sort of a JPEG of a of a vine maybe or some little flowers or some sort of thing going down it that. Where you can like engrave one and then rotate the pin and then engrave more around. Okay. A little work, but I was like, probably do it. Either engrave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it'd be kind of fun. Chris, Whose engraver was it? You use your oh, engraver sometimes. Yeah. See how you do guys, it. guys, I think I'll have the same engravers. Oh, okay. Yeah, we we'll just split up the the job. I was just curious how much one of those might go for. Uh, Craig Milliron has some. He bought, uh, I think he's got one for like 120 bucks. Oh, wow. I want to see. That's not bad at yeah. all. Yeah. Fun to play with. Yeah, right? Let's see a little more here. Let's try to get this little bit off. Feel free if you got any other announcements, Chris, as I sand and sand and sand. <laughs> Let's see. Well, you know what? <laughs> announcements. Hmm. What was that, Kenny? <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. Somebody just mentioned something in the chat. Let me see what that. Yeah, it's a good time for questions if anybody has any. Uh, oh, here Dwight Swyback says that um, back in 2015, I turned a couple of pins and they were given to Justice Anthony Kennedy. Oh wow! Very cool. Got a nice letter from him about the pins for him and his wife. I have framed the letter and I could show that to one group of the group if you'd like. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah, you, that would be awesome. Dwight, if you have it where you can show it to us later at the end of the presentation that'd be super what a cool thing to do right sometimes yeah. it feels a little silly having yeah. a presentation about making pens when i know we have so many amazing wood turners on our group i figure we got some newbies also that's right we do have new people that have joined yeah and there's a lot of uh people have turned a long time but never done a pen so there you go there you go So what grit are you on now? So I just moved up from 150 to 240. Okay. I'm just kind of going back and forth, trying to get this little bit. I know I'm going to have a little bit of trouble on that bottom half down here. I don't feel like there's chip in there that I don't want to go any deeper on. So it's going to be what it is. It's yeah, a character, a, right? That's the thing about acrylic, you know. Chipping is, is a problem. Yeah. It's okay. You hold it the right way. Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> no, no, that's, you just hope you, uh, it's, it's where you can put the clip over it. That's what those <laughs> right? clips at the top are for. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Oh, if that's the bottom? Oh. Well, you know what? We can switch it around. These are basically <laughs> the same shape. This is, like I said, typically what I do. This one's yeah, a little more pronounced. Do you do acrylic or do you do regular wood as well? I do some wood, but yeah, it's, it's mostly acrylic. Like I said, I, I like wood. Wood's great, but when it's such a small piece like a pen unless it's a, got a lot of great grain to figure it's hard to see any of the beauty of the um 
and personally, I, I love color, you know. So I like doing colorful pens. No, what's no, Bill? No. What's the most you paid for oh, a blank? Let's say that again. What's the most he's paid for an acrylic blank? Oh, what's the most you've paid for an acrylic blank? Hmm. So I, was, I think around twenty-five, actually. Twenty-five. Yeah, it was for oh this God. one. I think right here at the time. I think it was around twenty-five from Penn State. We're getting it all filthy. But is the blank? So it's the What's part the wood and part acrylic. Oh. And it's supposed to be like uh, a beach, right? <clears throat> Granted, it's all covered in white now with my three fingers. I think that's the most I've ever paid for one. Um, this one right here I'm working on right now, class supplies, it's like $12.99. Um, you never pour in your really own. They're really nice. I like those. But you know, it's you fun. Go. Every time you go to Rocker or something like that, you just browse the section and grab a few blanks for like four or five dollars. I did recently pick up actually a pen blank molds because as you know, I've talked about before, I like doing uh, acrylic, um, no resin I should say, I, epoxy resin. A lot of my bowls I do, I get bowls that have cracked and stuff like that are full of holes from termites and I will cast those in resin to fill all those holes. And so I haven't done anything yet but I did get that uh, little uh, silicone pen blank mold. Um, so and would kinda, you have to put that in a pressure pot to uh, cure it, or you know, I probably would with the pen blank mold because it will fit. Um, but it is so small; I don't know that it would need a pressure pot. But I can't really say for certain because I haven't done one yet. But it's not a big mold; it's not a lot of resin. I don't think it needs a pressure pot. Well, I have a pressure pot you can use if you want. <laughs> I just started to do stuff, and I was like. Oh, yeah, I know we had talked about that, maybe having a demo of that. That would be pretty cool. I'm up to 400 grit now. Yeah, we talked about maybe like doing a group meeting where people, like they did with the segmented turning, and go over uh, the different techniques of pouring resin and using a pressure pot and then turning it. That would be fun. That would be fun. I just uh, did one last week. I, I put a bowl, an oak bowl, and <clears throat> had some really big uh, cracks on the side. And so I put it, uh, did some burgundy kind of resin. My wife picked out the color. She's great for Valentine's Day with the burgundy color. And we got it going. And I typically, when I do it, I just get some like disposable plastic bowls or buckets. And get the wood in there, and uh, recently trying to uh, just hot glue the wood down to the bottom of the container, and that worked out pretty well. The resin, it's just a two-part resin. This part A, part B, equal amounts. Color it. <laughs> some burgundy with some gold glitter. She found some glitter and threw that in there, and then put it in this pressure pot. And so I run it about 50 uh, psi. I let it sit for about 24 hours and I can take it out and I still let it sit for a few more days just out in the open because when I first pull it out it's still not quite hardened but it's uh it's solid it's not going anywhere one I mean maybe it's too cold out or I didn't rex mix it well enough but it didn't quite harden as much as I wanted it to so I got it to a really good bowl shape right now I still have some voids so I'm gonna do some just a spot um, filling with the resin. It's going to take like forever. Just do each little hole at a time. But it saves a lot than trying to you know, fill the whole bowl up with resin because resin is not cheap. You know, nothing's cheap these days. Everything's going up in price. But resin is just going up like crazy. Also, if you want to buy a whole bunch of it right now before the price goes up. I think right. I saw a guy on one of the YouTube channels that used some of those plastic cutting board things, those, just those little thin plastic ones you can buy at Ikea, and he, he, he shaped it around the bowl so it was pretty tight to it. Yeah, there you and go. 
super glue to glue the edges, you know? Yeah, to seal it, otherwise it leaks yeah. out. Yeah, that's a perfect yeah, idea. Then he put in, that way he was using his little... He didn't have a lot of excess resin, I guess yeah. I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah absolutely, because what I typically do is... You know, all the wood I get is from the wood gathering crew, and thank you guys very much for all you do, because wood is expensive, and you know you guys get some great stuff. So I'll just turn it to the diameter I need to fit into one of my containers. So that way okay. it slides in just nice, and there's not a ton of extra resin. Because it seems a shame to you know fill this whole thing with so, so much resin that's just going to end up as shavings on the floor anyways. Because in the end, when the bowl said and done, what I was working on, it's just going to be the cracks that are filled with it, and that's it. I did do a uh, a bowl not too long ago with my daughter. I showed, did it. Don't tell. It was mostly resin with just a little bit of wood in it. It was really orange. And she didn't like it because it was too orange. And I said, "Well, your colors you picked out were red, orange, and yellow. So I don't know why you're upset. It's orange." Uh -huh. But it turned out really cool. And the resin, you know, it's just like these acrylic blanks. You could just sand it to a really uh, high grit, and it will um, shine really nice. So I'm not sure how we're doing on time here, Chris. You're doing fine. Yeah, one I got, of the things I found out um, years ago, I want to say it's probably been 10 years, one of the first things I ever turned acrylic was a handle for a shaving kit. Yeah, so yeah shave with. absolutely. I use it every day. I use it, and it's still shiny. And oh. It's nothing on it except you know, polish to. A, you know, yeah, there's no, you're not sealing it. You just yeah, just yeah, polishing. Yeah, yeah. that's it's amazing. Amazing to me that it can still be shiny after that, awesome. that use. Yeah. Okay, so next up, we got a choice to make for this acrylic. We have a shortcut. We got the it finished. I don't know if this is upside down for everyone. It is. There, oh, there we go. So. DA uh, polished gloss. It, it's just there's different, few different brands out there, but basically they usually tell you to go to around 600 or so um, grit, and then you do this. It's just kind of like a, a really high grit paste that you're just going to put on there, or if you have the time, I personally like to go through the pads. So it starts at 1500, works its way up to 12,000. I typically wet sand with these. I lay something down to protect the lathe. I got a little cup of water, I dip it in the water, go with that. So I'm not sure how much time we have. We just want to take the quick route. We can move on to pen assembly. It's only 7 o'clock, so I think we have plenty of time. Whatever you want to do. Right, let's do the, the high grid if we can. Okay. I'll make this quick as we can. I think I could get just a little cup of water. Sorry, I should have asked that before we even started the meeting. But we'll make this quick for you guys. Does anybody have any other questions or even comments about how they make their pens? Yeah, we can do that. Pour some in there. This guy over here. We're going to get going again. <laughs> Yeah, it's got two magnets on the back of the holder. I'd show you, but now I got water in it. That's just a little holder. It came with the magnets, actually. It came, they, they're recessed in already, so it was cool. It was on sale, and I came with all the pads for like $25. So that was a, a nice little deal. Uh, you know, it depends on how many things you make. This is probably my fourth set of pads in five years, so I guess a year. Maybe I use them longer than I should. All right? So get back to it. Automatically, when you get it wet, it's like, ooh, it's like when you put the uh, first start wiping a finish on your wooden bowl or platter. It's like, oh, man, that looks amazing. But then it dries a little bit. And I, oh, no, not quite done yet. So the first one I feel like is the most important. The last grid I used was 800. My little sanding pack only went to 600, and this is a 15. I felt like I wanted something in the middle between 600 and 1500. Bear with me. Keep going here. Do we have any other questions or comments that anybody's put in the chat?
Yeah. Well, uh, we're just going, going through standing, so we're free to talk about that. All right, so um, we're going to do a little off. Oops. Maybe we lost connection on one of my other computers. I think you can probably still hear me, though. Um, so the um, there was a question in the chat about uh, what's going on with the turnings at the uh, the, with the youth training program, actually. And so uh, Ron Fowler's been in charge of that. He's doing a great job. And um, uh, we could always use another couple of coaches, but um, they're doing well there. The uh, principal of the school is talking with the school district about allowing us to come in one night a week, uh, one night a month, uh, actually, and do um, use the lays there as sort of a training. Um, ideally, the um, goal would be that the people who come there and, and, and use the school and use the lays there would also help out as coaches. Um, I don't think we're going to make a requirement of that, um, but that's one of the things that, you know, one of the reasons the school's allowing us to go in there. So it would be in the evening, would there be no kids there? Um, we haven't got any specific dates or time set up, and they are, uh, they have a new head of the uh, facilities management, and like all bureaucracies, it's um, a question of, moving the quest, the uh, request up the bureaucratic chain. So not sure how soon we'll get an answer, but the principal is for it, and she's been um, been pushing for us to be able to get that. So I yeah, hope that works out. So for the evening classes, well, yeah, I know, you know, they want us to kind of train someone to, you know, teach on the Fridays, mm -hmm. but what else, what will we be doing there? Like we could do whatever we want. Training. Yeah, it's it's totally up to us to, to set whatever we want to do. And we've done in the past. We've had things like that where sometimes we have specific projects where uh -huh. we come in and and you know like everybody works on the same project. Other times we've just had it be more like an open shop and people would come and bring. Sometimes they'd bring their own stuff that they had maybe partially completed and wanted some help with and um you know where do we go with that so i think, I think we'll just it will depend on the the members who come and what their desires are yeah yeah i think it's great that we're able to do that i know personally you know i trained a little bit with uh, norm hinsman and like i said with gail and a little bit with phil Sargent. and there is nothing like the hands-on experience you know, when you first start doing something and you're trying to make your cuts and your tools chattering all over the place, mm -hmm. and they're like, no, do it like this. And they make the smoothest cut you've ever seen. <laughs> and then they show you how to make that smooth cut. And it yeah. just makes things so much easier. Yeah, especially people like Norm and, mm -hmm. and Phil, you know. Yeah, they've got some great turners yeah, on there. Yeah, Norm had a lot of patience with me, I'll say that. I was not catching on very quickly. I don't, I don't think I was his best student. Uh. I just did a, a mentorship with a guy who called up recently. He had a um, he had someone give him a lathe and a pretty much a complete system. I mean, oh, that's he awesome. had a lathe and a, a bandsaw and a bunch of tools and chucks. And I was like, God, he said this guy had a whole shop full of tools and said, eh, I'm just not using these anymore. You want them? You can have them. <laughs> so, Isn't that everybody's know, dream? Yeah, really. So... Uh, he didn't really know much other than watching YouTubes for how to, you know, turn. So I spent a couple hours over there last Saturday with him and his son, and, and then his neighbor from across the street who was also into woodworking. He came over and I mean, you had a whole yeah, seminar going. Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun though. We enjoyed it. And this is my first time presenting, and since it's through Zoom, I can't help but feel that this is like a little radio show. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's no one here to, to talk to, just yeah. microphones. Yep. All right, I just got one more to go, and then we'll be done with the sanding. That sure is pretty. I like the way the color's coming out. Yeah, it is a gorgeous little blank. There's probably like a dozen or so colors in their diamond cast series. Oh, I like this little rainbow one. It's just so you know, sparkly. How much did you say that blank cost, you think? $12.99. Oh, okay. 
Not when I bought it, but you know how things are right now. Everything goes up real fast lately. Yeah, I like that idea of pouring your own. I think that would be the way to go. All right. Try this off a little so bit. that was twelve thousand. Yes, I went from fifteen hundred all the way up to twelve thousand. Let's try it a little bit. To go there. Yeah, I think it turned out pretty well. I don't know how well you guys can see it from the camera. Pretty good, I think. Quite sparkly. Move this before I knock it down and spill water. Well. Thank you, Chris. All right. So now we're going to do some pen assembly as soon as I get everything out of my way. All right. I'm going to take these off. Um, yeah, I think I could do it right here. I'll set the pen press there. I'll take these off very carefully. I'm just going to lay a little paper towel down here. Yeah, perfect. Set this on here. Have you ever used the acrylic polish after you yes. finish with the little pads? Oh, that's not what. <laughs> I was like, that's not what. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I did. I got it right here. <clears throat> so I do this one. I also had, I think, the Penn State Industries one. It was kind of a green paste. Uh, there's a few different brands out there, but they definitely work well. I mean, I don't know. I just like doing the pads, but it works great. Don't turn it around. There you go. Yep. Yeah, that's the one I've used. They yeah. work pretty good. I like it. I think it works good. All right. So always try to get your bearings off and put them where you're not going to lose them because they do tend to disappear, these little small ones. All right. So now we're going to grab the rest of the kit here. Let me go and knock this out real quick, the rest of the mandrel. All right. Okay. That's a little better. Here we go. It seems like such a waste sometimes. There's like a million little plastic bags in these things. You know, I'm kind of particular. I used to try to open them by the little zipper, but I had to give up on that. Big, clumsy fingers did not work well for that. I'm just going to open these all up and set them here. All right. We'll kind of organize it the way it goes here. Garbage. No. So in general, this is how it's going to go. So what I've always done is I've always put it together with just a hand clamp. It's a little awkward as well, and then I'll show you another way to do it after that. So right now we're just going to start with the tip. It goes on the front of the pen. I'll get back under the camera just a second here. Okay. So we're just going to clamp it. Just got to make sure it goes in straight. Just go nice and slow. Hopefully it goes a little quicker with the pen press. <laughs> All right. And there we go. There we go. There's that. I'll show you again here. See how well you can see. I don't know if we can focus on it. How thin the material is there. So it's not a lot of material there. At least the way I was doing it. So now that we got the pen, the, the tip in there, now we got to put this in here. So this right here is the little mechanism for the twist pen kit. So this little brass end is going to go in first to the bottom portion of the pen, right up until that indention right there. So we're going to put that in. Go for it, Chris. I just want to say something. I have put these in backwards. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah, so that, the brass thing goes in because... Yeah, brass to brass. Uh, yeah, so don't do it the other way. So the, the, the pen refill is going to go in. And if you can see it, there are threads in here, and there are threads right here. So this will go through here and thread in, and that's how it stays. I will thunk in it. And so that's how it's going to sit. In the pen, like so. Yeah, pens are not easy to take apart. 
So I'm going to go and do this, this one again with my clamp because I'm used to it. And then we will do Chris's pen press. Just bear with me as I get this set up. The so same thing, we're just going to go in nice and slow, nice and straight, hopefully. There we go, stop right there. So now it's always good not to go too far and then slide the pen refill all the way in and then twist it in and then do a twist here so I will dunk in there from my clamp. And then I think I stick it out just right. Then it comes back in. And it's just inside the pen. One thing I did not show you real quick is all the pens come with something on the tip to protect it and keep it from leaking out. So this has got a little bit of like wax, which sometimes proves a pain to remove with your fingernails or however you want to do it. Some of them have just this little rubber tip, which is really nice because it just pops off. All right, so now that that is in again, extend it, looks good. Now we're going to put just a little center band on there, it just slides on. There we go. And then, last but not least, we're going to come over here and we're going to put the clip and the cap together and we're going to end up putting them on the top of the pen. So, we'll grab that pen and we'll do that. Like, Chris is going to show this part. I'm just standing right next to you. Hang on I got that. it. The problem with this um, pen press here is I've beat it up all the time <laughs> and it's gotten to be pretty inefficient. Uh, so I have to screw around with a little bit to get it to work correctly. But basically, you want to just open it up to where the pen fits into the space. Um, this one is which? This one. Perfect. The other thing for me always is you know where the where the uh, the pin part can go. The clip. The clip. Yeah. So you sort of decide you know what you want to cover up basically, which I like if there's an error on the pin. Perfect. <laughs> but this one doesn't have any error, so I don't know yeah. where you want it. Anywhere's fine. There you go. So I just stick it in between and got the hand back. That's probably the easiest thing to press in, right? The the cap. Yeah. The <laughs> you can kind of see what you're doing. Yeah. There you go. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Get this out of the way. Yeah. Time to step on anything else. All right, so we have oh, almost lost that. Two halves of the pen. Now they just slide on together, like so. If you mark it, then you can. There you go. I think that lines up pretty well, right? A little bit more like that. Yeah. So it lines up pretty good, all the way extended, and then closed. And then obviously, if you ever run out of ink, you simply pull the pens apart, the two halves apart, and you unscrew the pen refill and put the next one in. There's some more wax there. Stuff never comes off. There we go. And down right there is how you make a pen. A slimline pen. I have a few here I can show you. The thing with pens is they typically go away as gifts. So like I said, on Christmas I had 20 or 30 of them. Different ones. I have a few here. A little mechanical pencil. This one uses a 0.7 millimeter lead. It's kind of cool because on the end of it here, it's got a little eraser, and in the cap, there's excuse me, there's a sharpener. There's another one of the diamond cast blanks that I did oh, not too long ago. Came out pretty nice. My hands are still filthy. This one right here is just a, another slim line, and it's just straight across, nothing fancy. And sometimes with these, when they get so thin, I don't know if you can see it. But you can see the brass tube through the kind of more thinner, clear parts of the pen. And sometimes that's cool, sometimes it's not. Here's another diamond cast. Actually, I did this one yesterday, and my lighting in my garage was terrible. And I took it out in the sun. I go, oh my god, look at all those scratches. Terrible. Too bad I already assembled it. 
Here's one that's called a gear shift pen I made for my son. So this goes down and that extends the thing. But my son takes everything apart and lost the spring. And like I said, this last one, the con <coughs> concava pen, concava, from Penn State Industries. You know, pretty nice. I wish I had more to show you, but I gave them all away. Do you have anything to show, Chris? All right, yeah, I do. Um, let me grab this chair a second. Um, we're going to show a couple that um, Nana had done. So let me get to, since the computer crashed, I have to reopen my uh, PowerPoint. To, where did I put it? Let's see. Hold on a second. Sorry, I should have prepped for that while I was waiting. Uh, let's see. Okay, here we go. And back to here. So again, we apologize for all the audio problems too. This was quite the challenging day. Okay, we're gonna go to here first. Okay, so um I'd love for Leanne to tell us how she did that one. Yes. Um, that one I made uh, for the graduation of my daughter. It's just a, one of those uh, Wall Street 2 or whatever the heck they call them. Um, first, I did the blank and I used my bandsaw to cut squiggly lines. And then I put two different colors of uh, veneer between, between them and glued them back up and then proceeded. I, I think I have like four on that. And then when it came out, I looked at that and I said, oh, I should, you know, she likes green and stuff. So maybe I should do some leaves. So I kind of um, wood burned and um, then used pens to highlight uh, the, the leaf structure. That was really great. Okay, so you colored in the leaf structure? Yeah, see that's- Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's, awesome. It's just, it's it's this this kind of permanent pen. Yeah. And uh, I, I did I did the wood burning for the the little striations. Yeah, I you thought maybe that was well. a uh, like a a, a a fill of some sort. Yeah. Like what? A, what did you put over it to finish it? I think I put shellac because um, I I kept I I couldn't put anything else over it or it would blur it. Yeah, that's what I was wondering about that paint or, or the, the stuff you drew on yeah cool all right i think there's another one here this is my attempt at a celtic cross um i used my segmenting sled <laughs> to make the blank uh, i think it's mahogany and maple probably and then i don't like the middle band so i put the i left it out and i make my bottom blank just a little bit longer Mm -hmm. and then i would burn a line on it so mm -hmm. i have i've done quite a few um twist pens um when but, you make the bottom one are you uh are you cutting your own brass tube to the right length or, or um you... no i just i just leave the the little i use the tube that comes with the pack i just leave a little extra wood on the top you know, a little bit of the oh, hole. Oh, okay. I line well, it up more with the bottom uh -huh. and then leave a little bit on the top. So the brass doesn't go all the way through that last little section. Correct. That right? I, yeah. I measure, I, measured it for the the width of the clip. Uh -huh. And at least with the slimline pens, the, um, the bottom one barrel is the one that's real crucial because that's where the actual twist mechanical part goes in. But the top one, has a little bit of play in it that it could be a little smaller or a little bigger and it wouldn't really affect the <laughs> twist mechanism. Yeah. Cool. I like that. That's a really a neat idea. I like that leaving the center thing out. I'm going to try that. Let's see. There's something. In oh, okay. Just a comment. Um, does anybody else have any other pens they want to share with us? We're going to go. I do. Okay. Is that. Uh, let um, me, Robert. Um, okay, let me stop sharing. And Robert, let me um, hold on, Rob. Let me hold on one sec. Let me get you up here. Uh, yeah. 
I'll tell you, I've had more technical difficulties tonight. All right, one more time. There we go. All right, we got you, Bob. <clears throat> this is what I did for Christmas, and I also made it like a kickstand for your phone, so that when you're watching uh, YouTube or Zoom, you have a little kickstand to hold your phone up. It goes on your phone like so. Oh, I see. And it braces up, works. bounces oh, yeah. your phone. Oh yeah. So when you're watching, watching Zoom on your phone, so. So does that? Does that I made a set a of these to match for all the family members. Oh, very nice. I haven't seen that kickstand thing. <coughs> Anybody else got a uh, pen they want to share with us or any comments? I got a comment, Chris, if you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you, Tom. Um, that's what I wanted to mention on your uh, your twist pins there. When you're putting those together for your bottom part, the thing that I do when I press them together and I've worked with academy kids and that and I run into a problem where they'll often grind their bottom tube too short or shorter. Hmm. So I press my tube in your drive mechanism in stages where I test my, uh, my cartridge, my ink filler to see how far it's protruding. That way you can avoid the fact that it sticks out too far or it's too short. Yeah, I agree. Um, because, if you press it right up to that line that they designate on your driver, uh, oftentimes you may have ground that tube a little short and then you have too much sticking out. Yep. That's perfect. So like I, I say, I tested when I'm pressing it in, I might do it two or three times just to see. I, uh, I was going to say, I want it. yeah, Kenny yeah. said it and I agree with him. I do the same thing because I've, I've screwed those up. I was very impressed that Bill screwed <laughs> it correctly yeah, the I, first time. I was like, I, I didn't quite mean to go all the way to the line the first time. It just, you know, happened. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it always takes me two or three times to test it to make sure it's just That's a great right. tip. I'd rather go too short than too far. Well, uh, in, in addition to um, uh, testing, I also have a piece of wood that I have a V-groove in. And then uh -huh. uh, it's it, it's cut to the, the right length. So it doesn't matter how short or tall the middle is. It'll always put the put it to the right length. Oh, so it goes from would be the tip of the pen to where the top of the turn mechanism is. And that yeah, that, yeah that's true. That would be a set length, wouldn't it? And it doesn't yeah. matter. And I use it with my drill press and I just press it down until the, oh, it hits the top night. of that wood. I still oh. test because some, you know, it sort of, <laughs> you, <laughs> you can perfect. still screw it up. <laughs> That's a really good idea. Thank you for that. I'm going to have to play with that. Anybody else got any comments? I got one more I'd like to interject. Sure. Um, when you're doing the polishing, one of the things you might want to experiment with is I've done some with the four-aught steel wool and your polishing compound. And okay. I found you can almost eliminate all your wet sanding. Oh, there you go. I'll try that. Thank you. Uh, so, just try it once and compare it because you can always go back and do your wet sanding. But yeah, I found some acrylics that uh, uh, with the uh, four-aught steel wool after I've sanded up to 600 grit and then uh, done the steel wool with the polish, they really pop. You go, wow, why am I wet sanding? Mm. <laughs> all right yeah, yeah really yeah good awesome anybody else oh this is shan chris uh-huh this is yes. dwight you, you want to show that letter uh yeah dwight thank you for reminding us yes hold that up anyway, here, I guess. uh to your left a little bit your left there you go yeah uh, uh and a little reflection but very cool there it is hold it there Dave and Karen. Uh, I'll read it. Very nice. This, uh, Dave and Christian Dozer. Uh, uh, Dave Dozer was a neurologist here in town uh, that, and he grew up with Anthony Kennedy when they were kids. They, they oh. went all through high school together. The Stan was at, they were at Stanford together. And then Kennedy went, of course, to uh, the law school and he eventually became a Supreme Court justice. Anyway, uh, Dave was saying I had made a made a couple of pens for Dave and his wife, 
and uh, they really liked the, the pens. And then he got it, he was going to get together with Anthony Kennedy and his wife. And uh, he was saying, well, could you make some pens for, for them? Because I'd like to give them to them. I said, oh, okay. Anyway, I made some, that They but they were not not from uh, the local area. The wood wasn't from the local area. He said, no, I think I think that Anthony Kennedy would really like them from the local area. So I made him uh, some uh, uh, walnut and a couple of other woods. Anyway, they selected the walnut. And this is what... Uh, uh, Anthony Kennedy said, Dave and Kristen Dozer gave to Mary and me the beautiful black walnut pens that you have crafted. They are special, and when we use them, we will think often of the graciousness of Sacramento. Oh. <laughs> Warm thanks. Thanks for your gift. Remain your sister, Anthony Kennedy. And I also got one from his wife, too. So anyway, that, those were the kinds of things that, uh, and these are some of the pens that I have made. And uh, I, re I really like uh, doing that. And also, I was thinking, I, it's just, uh, let's see, yeah. Yeah, this is my setup. It's uh, a, uh, a Bonnie Klein lathe. And uh, it's the small lathe in comparison with the other ones. Anyway, that's where I make my yeah, pen. Yeah, hard to see, but yeah, that's cool. Well, thank you for sharing that. That's, Dwight. That's, that's a really, really great story. I love that. Yeah. It, it's, it's so wonderful that when something you made is um, appreciated like that. Yeah, yeah. really cool. Anybody else have anything? Chan had something to say. Chan? Yeah, if, there's a, if you do have to take the pins apart, Tony told me about this palm nailer. It's a nailer that fits in your palm and it goes and then it'll take the pin apart just like that. So the nailer. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what that I'll tell like Tony. I'm not sure. I gotta have to see that. Hey, what are you talking to Tony about that one? Uh, I'll run out no, to my garage and get it. I'll run out to my garage and get it and I'll be right back. All you right. know, Chris, can we show your uh pen kit set up over here? Oh uh yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll bring it over to that. Over. I thought this. I thought it was a pretty cool little setup that we could show everyone real quick. Um, here, let me. I got it. Yeah. So here, you want to describe it, Chris? No. Well, I don't know. it's <laughs> well, just you know, over the years, I got tired of trying to search for all those little pieces of plastic. So I buy the kits usually in bulk and get a better price on them, and then I separated out the. Um, the different colors and styles into these and then tubes that have not been um, scratched up yet are over here and then the ones that have been are already scratched up are over here and then um, yeah and then just the different pieces and, and then the ones that blew up <laughs> are over here yeah i so can make a few frankenstein yeah, pens at home yeah I, I i like the frankenstein pens they're fun and then this one does just got um just uh, some of the different parts. So different, I have some tubes that I can cut to different lengths that I want. And then, um, yeah, different si kinds of bushings and things like that. I just thought it was pretty cool when tube? I saw it, this tube? whole setup here. What was that? Do you cut your own tubes and how do you do that? I don't normally cut my own tubes, but um, I wanted to be able to. So I've cut them every once in a while when I want to do something unusual. Um, uh, yeah, and I, I was thinking about pouring some, like uh, Bill was talking about, I was thinking, oh, if I did some acrylic and poured something, um, you know, I'm not, it may or may not do the exact size that the pen kit is. So. Well, Rockler has a perfect little um, silicone pen making, pen blank making kit, mm -hmm. and it has these um, little plugs on the ends where you could already put the brass tube inside it. Mm -hmm. It'll hold the brass tube and you and pour the resin pour around it. Around it. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. I, I got hey, Chris. Try. Yeah. Chris, this is John Etheridge. Hey, John. Bushings. How do you organize the bushings? I get those <laughs> things mixed up, and I can, I have a well, bucket of bushings, and I don't know where they go. It, it's real easy for me because I only do one size. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Maybe that's the answer. Yeah. You know, <laughs> actually, I, I, take, I take it back. There is one. There's two sizes in there, but almost everything I do is slimline because because of that, I just. I was getting confused of with all the parts, so 
Yeah. yeah. I, oh, I personally have my little uh, tote kit just like Chris has, and it has all my bushings in there in their original packaging with all the, the code on it, and I have a list on my phone. So every time I go to order a new pen, it says what bushing it needs. I go to my phone list. and like, all right, do I got that one? Do I got that one? Oh, I got it. Well, you're too organized. Yeah, really. I couldn't <laughs> You're just that. too organized. <laughs> I need a spotlight, Shan, because I think he's going to show us something. Oh, there he is. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see, I unmute myself. Okay, so this is the air uh, palm nailer. So you hold it in your palm and you put the rod inside the pin, and this thing just goes like this, but a thousand miles an hour. Oh, I got gotcha. you. So it, all you do is put the rod inside the pin. Right. And then it, right. This thing just, so it just, it's rapidly does these little hammers and it'll knock the piece apart and you can take the pin apart anytime. So let me show this too, because I think this is what he's talking about is um, they, they have all these rods of different sizes depending on, you know, yes, that's what, what you're, talking what you're about. Take, taking apart. And um, I know, <laughs> Shan, why that's a great idea, because I have hurt my hand <laughs> slamming that pen down, that rod onto my my vice. You know, I have this great big metal vice with a flat spot, and I'm pounding the heck out of that thing, and my hand hurts. I like that nailer. <laughs> that's, that's a good trick. Hey, Chris. Yeah. Hey, Chris. Yes. It's Tony White. Hey, hey Tony. You can, take a, you can take a slimline pen apart. How you doing, Chris? You can take a slimline pin apart in less than a minute. With that thing? And you won't hurt your hand. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I recommend it. You, get them, you can get them at uh, Harbor Freight for about 12 bucks. Oh, you're kidding. So, oh, man, I'm picking no, one of those it's up. Very, and you can drive nails with it. That's what it is. It's a nail driver. <laughs> well, that's, that's just, a great tip, You just tip, put that Tony. thing over the head of a nail and it, push it down and it drives the nail down. Wow. That, that's really cool. I'm gonna twelve dollars at Harbor Freight. Chris. Why did yeah. I pay thirty? Because <laughs> you bought it from me. <laughs> Don't even have to make a plop. Oh, All right. overhead. Okay. Hey, Chris. Yes, Tom Miller here. Tom, go ahead. Uh, there was a question about organizing your pin bushings. Uh huh. Uh, the system I've come up with is I use. Uh, medicine bottles oh okay good idea and then i take then i take the uh, label that comes on the bag that comes with pin state and i tape them onto them medicine bottles and then i have a tray that i organize them in and uh, label the top of the tray and then i also keep a a, uh, a binder book with all of my uh, uh, pin instructions, installation mm -hmm. instructions, and mm -hmm. organize those according to uh, size. And sometimes it's advantageous that you can go back, if you don't have the right pin bushings, you can uh, kind of interchange on your uh, different pin kits because a lot of this stuff is overlapping. They just like to sell you bushings. Of course. So Tom, were you an engineer? <laughs> no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> just checking <laughs> my uh, wife was... i have a comment go ahead is that tech? i have a comment from an engineer i yeah. i had uh i was making a kit and i didn't have the right bushing and i made the bushings out of acrylic mm. one yeah. time yeah oh well oh. one time one time use cool all right any other comments uh, Chris, I did. I had to pause for a while, and I didn't get a chance to share uh, something. I don't. I'm sure somebody's all. We're just doing. Uh, we're sharing. Know, we're we're maybe, sharing maybe pen. Not. We're sharing pen stuff now. If if it's related to that, otherwise we're going to do that in a second. Yeah. Oh, it's it's. Oh no, it, it's pen. Okay, go ahead. Well, I have. Uh, I I make my own pen blanks. I'm sure, like most people do. And so uh, when I cut off the pieces, I oh, you all keep all those little pieces left over. Uh huh. I, I threw them away for a while and then I started keeping them because I did this. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> that is cool. I like just, it. Just for, I did it just for fun. Uh huh. Uh, and uh, 
and uh, learned a few things about it that you can't be, use ones too thin. Yeah, I That's bet. The only, that was, and then, but materials are different uh, because you have different hardnesses, and so uh -huh. you have to kind of be careful when you get down to the end because the real soft woods you'll sand right right through the you know. Yeah. Then you get. And then you then, then you don't get an, an even line going this way. Anyway. Uh huh. Yeah. I mean, that's really cool. Yeah. Maybe combine that with the acrylic and or a CA glue or something. Why can show this? We yeah. Go ahead. I, so I, I use I use just regular wood glue. Okay. So we're gonna have um. Bill show us one more thing here. Go ahead, Bill. So we had talked about the acrylic pen blanks and how we finish them, but we didn't really talk about the wood ones. So a couple different ways to finish it, you know, real simple stuff that you have it on the lathe, you know, is the friction polish, like the hut crystal coat. You do a few coats on that one. You know, high friction gets it to, you know, heat up and dry and get glossy. Another one, as long as you don't glue your fingers to it, is the CA finish. Everybody probably knows that one. And Chris and I were talking about it last night. And... Uh, Know, it's a little more time consuming, I think, but it also gives a really glossy finish. Um, just those are a couple ways to do it while it's still on the lathe. Yeah, does anybody else have any suggestions on finish they like? I just do the the little it comes in, it comes from hut and it comes in a little bar, and you just oh yeah, it's a friction polish. You just put right. it on, and then and then of course um, I usually buff them. That helps yeah. too. Yeah, yeah, I agree. All right, if that's it. Okay, well, I want to thank Bill for sharing with us and for yeah. agreeing to volunteer. And see, anyone can do this <laughs> demo. We want you guys to do some demos. I'm going to be calling on you. So yeah. Bill he, can do it. Anybody can do it, right? Bill can do it. Anybody can. Do it. Oh, my point is that he was not shy about doing, getting kind of in front of people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if you can do a Zoom one, it's really easy. Yeah. No one's staring at you. Yeah. So um, yeah, so thank you, Bill. You did a great job. We really appreciate it. Awesome. We're going to uh, stop the recording now and head on over and chat a little bit more about members, um, a member gallery. So hold on one sec. Uh, close that.